I'm actually starting my 29th year with the service. Um, 26 years was spent in collections. So it, I take great pride um, in, in my current role, just as it is a revenue officer, in educating everyone. Um, in the 26 years as a revenue officer, I'd never had a gotcha mentality. It was always educating the taxpayer because as a revenue officer, um, I was in the business of collections, right? So when I educated them, I did not want to see them back in my inventory six months down the road, a year down the road, whether it was 1040 taxes, 941 tax, 1120 tax, um, agricultural tax, because I was, you saw the whole, the whole realm of taxes that were owed. So I always educated. And then when the opportunity came on to be a stakeholder liaison, I was basically doing the same thing, educating. So now I'm on the side of handing out an olive branch and doing the same thing. So if I can continue that, now it's to keep, you know, nonprofits, small business owners, those just starting out, keep them out of the collection realm. You know, you don't want to end up on a revenue officer's desk. And if you do, then it's educating you on how to go about handling that situation. So with that said, we'll jump right in. Um, if you're not already familiar with our website, please be from, get familiar with it. Valuable information. It's available 24 seven and it's free of charge. www.irs.gov forward slash. And after you forward slash any keywords can populate tons of information. Um, in this case, if you want to put in employees versus contractors, you can certainly do that. You get a world of information. Um, I think on the last slide, it has my information. And I'll share that with you. Um, so Brandon, with that said, we can go to the next slide. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So I will discuss with you your responsibilities um, as an employer or one who has to pay others for services in the course of your trade or business, okay? So whether you're handling this yourself or paying someone else to do it, someone else will be a CPA, um, you need to know your responsibilities, okay? Um, we will look at the differences between an employee and an independent contractor, how to determine um, eligibility to work in the United States, the importance of a form W-4, the employer's responsibility regarding withholding, how to verify work names and social security numbers, um, the purpose of the new state registry, uh, the process of filing the form W-2, your obligations to notify employees about earned income tax credit, that's important, the role of the individual tax identification numbers, um, that's known as the ITIN, and then finally the process for enrolling in and using the filing information returns electronically system. That's also known as FIRE. Now, if you start to research that, the other program that's working in conjunction with FIRE, but it's not replacing FIRE yet, is called IRIS, I-R-I-S, okay? Uh, Brandon, we can go to the next slide. Great. So, um, Publication 15 also has a lot of information that this presentation was made up of. Um, again, www.irs.gov forward slash publication 15. You can get this information at your fingertips. So, um, again, as an employer, you are responsible for withholding and for paying certain taxes from your employees' paychecks. Okay. Now, these taxes are for their income taxes and their FICA. Uh, FICA, that is their Social Security and Medicare taxes. Um, uh, they are also sometimes called trust taxes because you hold them in trust or on behalf of in trust for your employees before you deposit them in the treasury or before you make your deposit at the bank for those of you on the call that run your own business. Now, in addition, you also have to pay the employer's matching share of FICA. And in most cases, you'll have to pay the federal unemployment tax, which is also called FUTA tax, F-U-T-A, and that's that Form 940, FUTA tax return. That's an annual return. So generally, you will not have to withhold or pay any taxes on payments made to independent contractors. But how do you know if a person working for you should be classified as an employee or as an independent contractor? So the courts have 
the courts have made uh, many facts on deciding whether a worker is an employee or an independent contractor. <clears throat> there are relevant facts that fall into three main categories, and I'll highlight those for you. The three categories are behavioral control, financial control, and the relationship of the parties that are involved, okay? So in each case, it's important to consider all three facts um, and no single fact provides the answer. So again, the three that we're gonna concentrate on is behavioral control, financial control, and the relationship between the two parties. Um, Brandon, let's go to the next slide. So, perfect. So the facts about behavioral control show whether there is a right to direct or to control how the worker does the work, okay? So a worker is an employee when the business has a right to direct and to control the worker. The business does not have to actually direct or control the way the work is done as long as the employer has the right to direct and control the work that needs to be done. Okay, so as an employer, ask yourself a couple of questions. Does my business have the right to direct and control the worker, how the work is done and how the work I hire him to do, okay? Do I direct when and where the work um, needs to be done? Do I determine what tools or equipment to use or where to purchase supplies and services? Do I control hiring? Do I control what work a specific individual must do and the order in which the work must be done? Do I train the worker? So if you have the right to control what will be done and how it will be done, then the worker is an employee. That's what we call behavioral control, okay? Um, Brandon, next slide, please. So financial control, okay? This is another important factor to, to consider, as I mentioned earlier. Again, ask yourself, who directs or controls the business aspects of the work? So as an employer with employees, you would direct or control the business aspects of the work. These include things like um, <clears throat> how the worker is paid, whether expenses are reimbursed, who provides tools or supplies, things of that nature. Independent contractors. Um, however, um, are in business for themselves, keep that in mind, they usually offer their services to the public and may have a significant financial investment in their own business. Um, they may also have their own tools and equipment. Independent contractors are more likely to have an out-of-pocket business expense and can have profits and losses as well, okay? Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so. When considering this final area, think about the relationship you intend to have with your worker. If you provide employee benefits, such as health insurance or pension plan, paid vacations, sick days, this generally indicates an employer-employee relationship, okay? Also consider the importance of the worker's services. If the worker provides services that are a key aspect to your regular business activity, it is more likely that the worker, again, is an employee. It's important to remember that just signing a contract does not automatically make the worker an independent contractor. Deciding the worker's employment status up front is important for you and the worker. If you misclassify worker, workers as independent contractors and you have no reasonable basis for doing so, you may be liable for the employment taxes and have to pay employee taxes. So again, clarify things up front with, um, with whether they're going to be an employee or a contractor. If you're still uncertain about a worker's um, employment status, we certainly can help. Um, <clears throat> you can send in a form SS8. So an SS8 is a determination of worker status for purposes of federal employment taxes and income tax withholding. Again, again that can be found on our website. Um, and the IRS will send you and the worker a determination letter as well. 
Again, you can find that form SS8 um, on our website at www.iris.gov forward slash, and you can put in SS8 instead of spelling out the whole form, what it stands for, all right? Again, determining the status of a worker is just the first step in this whole process of determining the responsibilities. All righty, uh, we can go to the next slide, please. So again, hiring employees. Now we're gonna now I'm gonna look at some more detail about responsibilities that you have, um, employees. Okay. So in this part, we're gonna examine a couple of things. Determining eligibility to work in the US, okay, United States, needing form W4, social security number verification, understanding the state's new hire registry preparing and sending W-2 forms, altering employees in the earned, uh, excuse me, alerting employees in the earned income tax credit and requiring individual tax identification numbers. So I'm gonna start with how to determine the eligibility of your employees to work in, legally in the United States. So as an employer, you are responsible for determining that, an employ that employees are eligible to work in the US. So to work in the US, the employee must be a US citizen, a national or legal permanent resident, or must have been granted authorization to work in the United States. US citizenship and immigration services or US CIS requires all employers and employees to complete the form I-9. I-9, Employment Eligibility Verification. While citizens and nationals of the US are automatically eligible for employment, they must too present proof of identity and employment eligibility by completing that form I-9. Now, as an employer, um, you complete the employer section of the form. This certifies you have reviewed original documents establishing the identity and employment eligibility of the employee. Form I-9 lists several documents a combination of documents the employee can show to satisfy this requirement. For example, an employee may provide a US passport or a driver's license and or a birth certificate. Um, you can find the form I-9 as well as the other information that I mentioned on the USCIS website, which is again, www.uscis.gov forward slash and in this case, this case, I-9. I'll repeat that in case you're writing it down. Um, www.uscis.gov forward slash I-9. So the, now the employee has three business days from the date employment begins to show you the required documentation or a receipt for a replacement document if documents are lost, stolen, or destroyed, okay? Life happens and things happen, okay? so. While you can terminate the employment of any employee who does not submit a complete form I-9 and the required documentation, you must apply this rule to all employees. Employers are not responsible for the authenticity of documents. However, if a document does not appear genuine, do not accept it. So do the eyeball test, okay? Um, you do not need to file an I-9 with the U.S. Uh, CIS, but you must keep the I-9 for three years after, excuse me, for three years after the date of hire or one year after employment ends, whichever is later, okay? So again, there's good information on their website as well. All right, Brandon, we can go to the next slide. Great, so each, each employee must complete a form W-4, which is the employee's withholding allowance certificate, okay? Um, and this might be a review for some, or this might be um, new for, for some as well. So use the employee's gross wages um, and the information on the form W-4 to calculate the amount to withhold. Now, we also have a calculator that's online at, on our website as well that can help assist you with this. This information includes the employee's marital status, the number of withholding allowance is claimed, the employee's desire to have the additional tax withheld, and the employee's claim to exemption from withholding if that's applicable. Now, if an employee does not give you a signed W-4, 
withhold tax at the single rate with no withholding allowances, okay? If an employee claims uh, to be exempt from withholding, that exemption only applies to income tax and not to social security or Medicaid taxes, okay? That is the FICA taxes. Employees claiming exemption from withholding tax must submit a new um, W-4 each year by February the 15th to establish the exempt status. Um, <clears throat> now, the, we are encouraging taxpayers to use, I uh, mentioned the, the uh, withholding calculator to perform the paycheck checkup. And again, that can be found on our website, www.irs.gov. You can forward slash payments, or you can also put forward slash paycheck checkup. All right, perfect. So now I'm gonna look towards verification of employees' social security numbers. Um, so another responsibility you have as an employer is that you are required to, to get and verify each of your employees' SSNs, social security numbers, okay? The Social Security Administration offers employers three methods to verify social security numbers. First, you can use the SSN verification service to verify up to 10 names and SSNs instantly or upload batch files up to 250,000 names and numbers and receive results the next business day. So you can look at these options further on, on the Social Security Administration's website. Their website is www.ssa.gov forward slash employer. And then you can click on the verify SSN link. So it, it's kind of it kind of toggles you through that. I haven't checked it probably in about a year or two. So um, you can go on there and kind of follow those steps on the on the links. Second, in an emergency situation, employers can call the 800 number. And now I've checked this recently. The number has not changed. It's 800-772-6270. And then once your user authentication is complete, an agent will provide you the name and SSN verification over the phone, okay? And then the third step, you can submit your real request on paper to your local Social Security Administration office. Your local office will provide you with formatting and submission instructions. Now, some offices even accept fax listings. When you do the SSN verification, the Social Security Administration will only tell you if the name and SSN number match, okay? They will not tell you the correct SSN, okay? Um, if the name and number do not match, it's up to you to correct the name and SSN with your employee, okay? I guess it's disclosure reasons, uh, reasons that the SSA have in place. Now, once, excuse me. Now, once your employees provide that information and you verified it, you must also send information on your new employees to your state's new registry. The state matches records of the new hire registry against child support records and the state and national levels to locate parents who do owe child support. The information you send includes your business name and address, EIN, which is your employee identification number, and the name and address and SSN of the new hire. Because most of this information is on a completed form W-4, many states accept a copy of the form W-4 with employer information added. Quarterly wage reports and unemployment claims are also required as well, okay? Um, we can go to the next slide. Perfect. So now I'm gonna talk about the uh, W-2 forms. So as an employer, you must complete a form W-2, okay, which is the wage and tax statement um, for each of your employees every year. The form shows the amount of compensation paid to employees and the amount of tax withheld for the year. The forms are sent to the Social Security Administration, um, who also uses this form to update the employee's lifelong earning history. And then um, from that earning history, it calculates the employee's benefits. Okay, we're all, I think, familiar with that. Because this information is important, um, you can be assessed a penalty 
for W-2 names and SSNs that don't match, okay? Um, there are instructions for forms W-2 and W-3 um, for more information that goes into penalties, okay? I believe publication 15 highlights some of those, but again, you can also Google that on our website. Um, it's important that an employee's name and social security number um, are, are as shown on the, on the W-4, match your payroll records and the form W-2. So make sure everything matches because if it doesn't match and if you're running a business, now you've got to correct not only the W-2, you got to correct the W-4, you got to correct the, the form 941, which is the employee's quarterly returns. You got to correct the 940 future return. If you're a corporation, you got to then now correct the 1120, okay? So it, it all runs together, then it flows through your 1040 return. So everything is, everything is connected. Um, also remind employees to report any name change first with the Social Security Administration and then to you. Name change if someone gets married, okay? Make sure employees know that notifying their employer of a name change is not enough. So they must also complete a form SS5. The form SS5 is an application for a Social Security card um, to have the name change on their Social Security record. The form SS5 and additional information are again available on the Social Security Administration website. Again, I keep repeating this because it's important, www.ssa.gov, okay, for Social Security Administration. Now, documenting the steps you take to obtain and correct any name and Social Security number mismatches may help you avoid costly penalties down the line with us. One of those steps is getting the form W-4, which also shows an employee's name and social security number and keeping it in your files. Now, if you relied on the information provided by your employee on their form W-4 to prepare their form W-2, the IRS may waive penalties, okay? Um, I've seen it done. Um, that's called reasonable cause or first time. So uh, they, again, they may waive penalties. The law does not allow a waiver of penalties where an employer had reasonable cause for including incorrect information on form W-2. So just keep that in mind. Um, all employees must issue W-2 forms to report wages and withholdings to their employees by January 31st. If your employee leaves before the end of the year, you can give them their W-2 at any time after they leave or as long as it's before January 31st. If any employee asks for their W-2, you have 30 days after their last pay date or 30 days after they leave, whichever is later, okay? Um, Brandon, we can go to the next slide. Slide, slide, slippity slide. All right. Um, now, W-2 forms, can be filed electronically with the Social Security Administration. Um, they have two electronically filing methods, okay? Now, companies filing 250 or more forms, W-2 must be filed electronically. Again, 250 or more must be filed electronically, and electronic copies of W-2 forms must be sent to the Social Security Administration by January 31st. In the first method, um, you upload a wage report. If you use software that matches the required format, you can upload your files to the SSA, okay, Social Security Administration. Software specifications and more information can be found on their website. In this case, you would forward slash employer. Uh, click on the electric, on the electronic W-2 filing handbook link. So everything's uh, mapped out for you on their website. Um, the second method, um, called W-2 Online. You can complete up to 50 W-2 forms on their website and print copies suitable for distribution for your employees. Uh, in this method, no software is required. Um, a form W-3 transmittal of income and, and tax statements is created for each W-2. Online report, even if multiple reports are, in the, are for the same EIN. Again, Information can be found at the electronic W-2 filing handbook 
which is on the Social Security Administration website as well. Okay. Um, both online options require registration with the Business Services Online, also known as BSO. Um, again, on their website, SS, www.ssa.gov forward slash BSO, or you can spell it out, Business Services Online. So from the BSO website, you would select register and complete the information. You will also be assigned a user ID immediately and you can choose your own password, okay? I don't know about you guys, but my head spins with passwords. I wish the IRS would just go to a thumbprint and be done with password, but there's authentication and we have to consider safety um, and, and cybersecurity. And that's a whole new other presentation that I can do for you guys. So anyway, Third-party preparers also need to register. So if you're being represented by, by um, a power of attorney, keep that in mind. So once uh, they only they need to register only once uh, and not for every client they represent. So that's good news. Of course, if you choose not to use electronic system, uh, you may still send the W-2 forms by mail along with your form W-3s. So no matter which method you use, W-2s, um, are due to both employees and Social Security Administration by January 31st, okay? So I've covered the major areas of responsibilities to employees. Um, two more areas um, that we need to cover. Earned income, tax credit for individuals, um, and obviously the tax identification numbers, okay? Um, we can go to the next slide, please. Yep, next slide. So independent contractors, I just want to mention to you, um, I, I, can, I can do a whole new um, presentation also on independent contractors, but I want to bring to your attention publication um, 1779. That goes into employee versus independent contractors. Great information to be found there as well. So. Now, we look at your responsibilities regarding independent contractors. So for independent contractors, you follow form 1099 miscellaneous with the IRS, okay? Make sure you give a copy um, to the independent contractor again by January 31st, whether you choose to file a form 1099 with the IRS by paper or electronically, the deadline again is January 31st. As with form W-2s, uh, though, if you have 250 or more 1099s, you must file it electronically. Uh, you don't need a transmittal form, um, and filing electronically allows you up to 10 days uh, from transmission to stop processing. Um, this means you have, have an opportunity to make corrections to your final transmission date before the due date. The IRS electronic system for filing 1099, as I mentioned earlier, is called FIRE which is filing information returns electronically. I tell you, with the IRS, we love our acronyms. Um, again, to use the FIRE system, you must complete a form 4419. Okay, that form 4419 is an application for filing information returns electronically and mail or fax that form to the IRS at least 30 days before the due date of the returns for the current year processing. Now, after the application is approved, the IRS will assign you a transmitter control code, also known as a TCC. When you receive your TCC, you may create a user ID, password, or personal identification number known as a PIN right away, okay? Um, so for more specific, for more information using FIRE, um, publication 3609 goes into more information on that. Again, you can find that publication on our website, www irs.gov. If you put in publications, tons of publications will populate. In this case, just put in publication 3609, um, which, will, will, which will populate filing information returns electronically for business e-filers. Now, although the fire system is easy to use, you must use the pre-approved software, okay? You can develop your own software by following the specifications in publication um, 1220. Publication 1220 um, goes into the specifications for filing forms, and it gives you a list of forms 
that you can file electronically. Okay, I'm not gonna go over them because there are quite a few, but it does highlight the form 1099. Now, to, to find a vendor who sells pre-approved software or for a transmission service provider, I advise you to look at publication 1582, um, which is information returns vendor list. Now keep in mind, we do not endorse or approve products and services offered by these vendors, but it gives you a good starting point, okay? It's simply, this publication, uh, 1582 on these vendors are simply for your convenience and gets you uh, gets the ball rolling with it on it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this just gives you um, a look at our, our, web, our web page. Um, on this, it highlights um, some identity. I, I think it looks at theft central website. So keep that in mind. But you can toggle around on there on the website. It has individuals. It has businesses, self-employed. I think that, that's more important there. But really good information on here. Again, you can look at www.irs.gov. Or I'll highlight um, when I'm done with my presentation, simply irs.gov. Great information there as well. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Here's some important numbers for you to make note of. Um, there's phone number for business and specialty taxes. There's the e-help desk, okay? There's also the phone number for important um, re uh, information, return reporting information there as well, um, report tax schemes, and then our national taxpayer advocate. And then the final, Slide, Brandon, we go to the final slide. There's my personal information. Um, I'm, officially, I'm Robert Graham, but, but my stakeholders and friends call, I go by Bobby. So please feel free to call me Bobby. That doesn't have my phone number. So let me give you my phone number, my direct number. Um, is Eric, I'm in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Um, and my direct number is Eric 213 three, five, one, five, okay? Now, in addition to being your stakeholder liaison, I am also part of the data breach cadre team, okay? So if there are any return preparers out there, especially around filing season, pre-April, extension for October, pre-October, if you feel that your EFIN has been breached, I'm your first contact. Okay, we, we don't like those calls, but if any of you feel that um, your information has been compromised, I'm your first call. So I'm on the data breach cadre team. You know, I'll solicit certain information and then I forward it up to um, the next level of, um, of security. And trust me, I don't like those calls, but you know, I'm, I'm here to handle those, any, any, any of those data breach calls. Um, so with that said, um, I will certainly leave it open for any questions at this time. Um, if there, if you know, if there aren't any questions at this time, I do have some important updates that I do want to go over with you as well. You know, please uh, keep my email on hand. Um, if questions come up down the road, please email me. Okay, hey Bobby, I've got this question. Hey Bobby, this came up. Um, if I don't know the answer, I will certainly research it. Um, I have a good team that I can bounce ideas off of. And if our, my team doesn't know the answer, then we go to the next level uh, to help research it for you. Um, so with that, um, Shay or Brandon, um, I will certainly leave it open to you guys for any questions and we'll go from there. All right, Angela is actually gonna monitor the, the chat for us here. I do see. Okay. Uh, I do see one question. Uh, so do you have any information on how a business owner can pay themselves? How they can pay themselves? Mm -hmm. um, can you elaborate just a little bit more on that? I mean, you can, my first inclination, you can pay yourself with a W-2. Uh, Sean, do you want to unmute and 
and give any other details for that question. I'm I'm thinking that we we had some discussion on that uh, from a, a tax consultant a couple of weeks ago, and so I'm guessing that that is is related to uh, to some of the information that came out there. Okay, Anything you, you want to add? Been, on that? Go ahead. Yes, I, I've been to different business workshops, and they said that. Uh, as a, if you're a business owner, like a sole, um, sole member LLC, that you can pay yourself. And I just want to get, since you are a state holder with IRS, what's the correct way of doing that? And okay, there's any so, specific uh, forms we need to use. Okay, so, so you got, you got to clarify this business owner. Is this business owner that you men, you mentioned? Is this a sole prop limited liability? Is this a corporation? Yes, so, what, so sole member LLC. Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna have to. I'm not well versed on sole member LLC, but I'll have to research this. Um, Angela, if you can shoot me an email on this, that way I can I can I can elevate it. So sole, how do they pay themselves? Is that yes. correct? Yes. So I I okay. I know of a couple businesses that have independent contractors, but they the owner also pays themselves. And it actually how, decreases how, has it, how much tax how you it, owe. So how have they been? How have they been paying themselves? Um, the W four, I think. Okay. They That's said they researched question. it, but it's not. I like to hear <laughs> from the horse's mouth. <laughs> right. No, no, I don't blame you. Yep. Let me. So, yeah, so LLCs LL, LL, LL are a, a different. It's not clear cut. It's not a black and white answer with LLCs. It's a, it's um, I'll have to I'll have to get do some further research and reach out to um, my research team to to make sure I'm getting you the right answer. So um, thank you. So Miss Robertson, are, are you able to go back to the slide, the previous slide? Brandon, can which which one do we want to go back to? Yes, thank you. I can. Um, I'm also. Go ahead. So let me just uh, kind of piggyback. Um, Ms. Robertson, uh, we actually did um, a previous tax training on that on January the 4th, and I'll be happy to provide you with uh, a copy of that recording. And I think that'll be helpful for you. Thank you. Yeah, because again, keep in mind, we're, we're dealing with different perspectives here. So, um, you know, Robert being directly with the IRS as a liaison, and so his role and kind of his perspective is going to be a little different than what you're going to get from the tax consultant, which is what that training was on the 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 force. So thank you, Angela, for uh, for that one. Um, and someone asked the question about receiving the recording and slides. And yes, we'll be providing those for you um, after the session today. Do y'all need me to track back on any of the uh, any of the slides? Or are we good? To ask your questions now. If not, I've got some great updates for y'all. Um, yes, if you could go ahead and share your updates. I'm not sure if you have any specific um, updates on the, you talked a lot about the uh, independent contractor classification and misclassification and um, in industry and trucking industry specifically, I think in early January, they published a new language about um, classification of those workers. And there's now from three, I think, to six rules. So uh, basically, we're kind of needing to push over to a W-2 structure, um, more so in our industry. Um, so I don't know if you have any updates on that specifically, but I am eager to hear your other updates if you don't have that. I, from, from thinking back, I, there's always been these six questions where if you answer yes to them, then they're employee. If you don't answer yes to them, then they're a subcontractor. I think I think the important thing to keep in mind, um, and, and also, you know, I mentioned that publication um, 1779, that really gets into the roots about employee versus uh, contractor. If you're if you've got like behavior control, if you're controlling a lot, 
then 99% of the time, that's going to be an employee. So, you know, keep that in mind. Subcontractor, if they're bringing their tools, if they're bringing a certain trade, if they're come and go when they want, if you don't have anything set, but you've got a job lined up, so they're not meeting all those, all the criteria to those questions that are there that you had mentioned, um, then they're probably going to be a subcontractor. Um, but double check with that publication 1779. And um, Shay, we can certainly talk down the road about me coming in doing a presentation just solely based on um, employee versus um, subcontractor. And that's something we can look at down the road as well. Um, but I, I do <laughs> wanted to, um, to give you all some updates. Uh, um, just uh, that came towards the end of the year, beginning of the year. Um, and this, these updates can be found at irs.gov. If you go irs.gov, you can go in there and look at yourselves. Um, we did announce new voluntary disclosure program uh, for paying back erroneous ERC claims. You know, those ERC claims, um, you know, there were all those scams out there. So be aware of those. Um, applicants are due by March 22nd. Um, this is to help businesses who want to pay back the money that they receive for filing employee retention credit claims in error. Okay, just I'm just highlighting. Um, the IRS did send out uh, over uh, 20,000 letters disallowing impro improper ERC claims. Um, the IRS also helped uh, taxpayers by providing penalty relief on nearly 5 million um, 2020 and 2021 tax returns with unpaid balances. Um, new penalty relief for approximately 4.7 million individuals, uh, businesses and tax exempt organizations that were not sent automated automated collection reminder notices during the pandemic. Uh, the relief will total 1 billion and most of those receiving it uh, make under 400,000 a year. Uh, so there was tax relief. Um, IRS also announced a delay in form 1099K reporting threshold. Um, that was also due to the ERC scams. Um, as you know, and just uh, as a reminder, the IRS does not make any more unannounced visits. So if any of you are rep representing clients that are getting knock on the doors, um, they cannot go unannounced. Revenue officers, revenue agents, they have to send an appointment letters, okay? Now I did find out the only people within the IRS that can go unannounced are die fuel inspectors. And I spoke to someone in Greensboro, they said, Bobby, dial fuel inspectors go out unannounced because um, if they don't go out unannounced, then the fuel can be moved. I guess the fuel and tanks can be moved. Move. But when the dial fuel inspector goes out, they go out with proper credentials and identifications. Okay. Um, just to give you some updates on return filing updates as of December of last year, 1040 returns, 6 186,000 are unprocessed. Of the 686,000, 600,000 of those require error correction or special handling. 1040X returns, 844,000. 941 returns, 44,000. So those numbers are declining. Again, I know y'all don't want to hear this, but COVID threw a wrench in it, and we're re finally recovering out of that. Um, 941X. 1,057,000. The reason 941X is high because of the ERC claims that there was a moratorium on through the end of the year. Um, third party authentication, the form, um, the power attorney form 2848 and the 8821. They are being processed in the order that they are being received. Um, if there are any representatives out there, you are encouraged to file it online through your tax pro account. And now these are just reminders. Uh, for the things that are available online. Your online account, uh, you can view things on your online account, such as tax records, adjusted gross income, estimated tax payments. The document upload tool, also known as DUT, great information. You can find the information on our website. Um, document upload tool um, is in response to an IRS notice or letter. So if you receive an IRS notice or letter, and they're requesting documents, you can use the document upload tool. It saves time. Um, it's, it saves the, um, the hassle of maybe faxing tons of documents. So look that up. Um, I, did, I forgot to mention this in my presentation. I did mention FIRE. 
but IRIS, IRIS is the Information Returns Intake System. Now, I did a presentation last week, and there, there was a concern if FIRE was going to be eliminated. FIRE is still up and running and working in conjunction with IRIS. Again, IRIS is the Information Return Intake System. Um, it's an online portal um, to file, again, 1099 series information returns, okay? It's not replacing FIRE. Um, you can also use direct pay to, security, to securely pay your taxes from your checking and savings account, okay? I'm just, again, highlighting these. These can be found on irs.gov. Um, you can get your tax records um, by requesting your transcripts online or via mail. Um, identity protection pin or IP pin, protect yourself, okay? Uh, from tax-related identity theft that tells you how to register for your IP pin. Um, again, Shay, I'm on the Data Beats Cadre team. If you feel this is something that you want to present to the group down the road, I can do a presentation on the IP pin. Um, I mentioned in this presentation the tax withholding estimator to help with a W-2. Look that, please, please take time to look that up. The IRS to go mobile app, that's on our website as well. You can check your refund status with the IRS to go mobile app. You can make a payment. You can get uh, free tax help as well. And then finally, um, the tax assistance locator center. Um, you know, that helps you find the nearest tax office, which is uh, the tax assistance center where you can schedule an appointment to go and talk to someone face to face. Um, and then lastly, I just want to mention um, we are hiring across the board, whether it's revenue officers, revenue agents. Um, tech services, um, stakeholder liaison, we advise you to please check usajobs.gov, okay? Um, like I said, I am in the 29th year with the IRS. It's been a great career. Um, so please take time to look that up. Uh, folks, I know time is important. I really appreciate the invite working with Shay and everybody else that worked hard behind the scenes to put this together. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I take pride in serving you, you folks and your organization. Please call on me. Um, I will certainly look into that question about the LLC and how the LLC does pay themselves. Um, I will circle back to Shay on that. And Shay, I guess she will share it with you. With, um, with Shay will share it with um, my phone number. I shared my email. Again, my email is robert.l.gram at irs.gov. Uh, hit me up if any questions come down the road. And with that, folks, my time is up. And uh, please reach out whenever, whenever you have something that comes up. Thank you so much for having me.